Chapters 24 and 25 of That Affair at Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson. Chapter 24 The Secret. The dusk of evening was falling as we were ferried across to the city. I bade Godfrey good-bye and took a cab direct to my rooms, for I was weary in body and spirit. But a bath and dinner improved both, and at eight o'clock I was ringing at Mr. Royce's door, for I knew how anxious he would be to hear my story, and besides I owed him some reparation for leaving him alone at the office. He opened the door himself, and his face brightened at the sight of me. "'Why, Lester!' he cried, and shook hands warmly. "'Come in. I'm mighty glad to see you.' "'I thought you'd like to hear about it,' I said. "'Of course I shall. It was like you to think of it. "'I wanted to talk it over with you. It may help to straighten things out. "'I was afraid there wouldn't be time at the office.' "'We are rushed there, and that's a fact. "'Suppose we go up to the den. "'We can talk our talk out there. "'Though,' he added as he led the way up the stair, "'we could do that anywhere to-night. "'I'm keeping bachelor's hall. "'That affair at Elizabeth so upset my wife "'that she's gone away to the mountains to get braced up. "'Here we are,' and he threw open a door. It was a cheery room where he had gathered together the impedimenta which had marked his progress through bachelordom, mementos of his college days and such other possessions as were peculiarly his. Now, he said, when we were settled, let's have the story. Of course I've read the papers, but I hope you won't take that into account. So I told it step by step while he listened silently, save for an occasional exclamation of astonishment. "'It's the most remarkable thing I ever heard,' he said when I had finished. "'I don't wonder that you believed at first that it had some connection with the Lawrence affair. "'It was certainly a remarkable coincidence that they should happen together as they did. "'And the first affair is as deep a mystery as ever?' "'Godfrey says it's deeper than ever. "'I showed him Miss Lawrence's photograph "'as we came in on the train together, "'and after he'd looked at it "'he said it was the strangest puzzle "'he'd ever encountered. "'It's absolutely unexplainable.' "'Mr. Royce smoked for a moment in silence. "'Of course there must be some explanation,' he said, "'and an adequate one. "'Marcia Lawrence wouldn't have run away "'without good and sufficient reason.' "'No, I agreed, but there's one thing certain. "'Whatever the reason, it isn't of a nature to render the marriage impossible. "'She was probably overwrought when she wrote that note to Curtis. "'Something had upset her so suddenly and completely that she couldn't see clearly. "'How do you know that? "'Don't you remember her mother's last words to me? "'She said it would be for Curtis to decide.' "'Yes, I remember, and I think there's no question as to what his decision will be.' "'No,' I agreed. "'Most men would be glad to get Marcia Lawrence upon any terms. "'Not Curtis. "'But then he's desperately in love. "'Maybe he'll be willing to recede a shade or two from his ideal.' "'He won't have to recede,' I asserted confidently. "'She's spotless, whatever the secret.' "'I hope so,' agreed our junior slowly. "'Well, they'll have to fight it out together when they meet on the other side. "'If I were Curtis, I'd be mighty shaky about that meeting. "'And I. "'Of course,' I added, "'the whole mystery hinges on that letter from New York. "'Godfrey imagined he knew the contents, "'but the event showed how wide he was of the mark. "'He had a theory that the letter was written "'by a disreputable, blackmailing husband of the girl "'whom she'd believed dead.' That was his theory from the first, the only possible explanation, he called it. Then when he found that a picturesque stranger had asked the way to the Kingdon cottage, he immediately concluded that the letter had appointed a rendezvous and that Miss Lawrence had kept it, all of which was afterwards shown to be mere moonshine. Not the first part of it, Mr. Royce objected. There's been nothing to disprove that. Nor anything to prove it true but it has a certain speciousness yes all of godfrey's theories have that do you remember what a perfect one he built up in the holiday case and how it fell to pieces well i believe this is wilder yet 
a look at miss lawrence's face will show you she hasn't any past of that kind godfrey himself admits that now my companion ran his fingers savagely through his hair of course i don't know anything about it he said but i've already told you how this affair affects me trust me lester there's some terrible secret just below the surface i wanted to say as much to curtis but didn't quite dare that's why i shiver at the thought of that meeting i pity him when he comes face to face with it that reminds me i found an old photograph of him the other day he turned to his desk and after a moment's search brought out a card he gave it to me when we were chums together at college he added and handed it over to me it showed curtis as he was at twenty or twenty-one the face was plumper than i knew it and the skin much fairer the hair was worn longer and the absence of beard or moustache revealed fully the singularly pure lines of the lower portion of the face a poetic face yet full of fire and vigour we used to call him the butte went on my companion i told you that he was rather girlish looking well see here here he is as the soubrette in a burlesque we got up in senior year he handed me a group picture including the whole company the central figure was a charming girl with admirable arms hands shoulders an inimitable way of holding the head great scott i shouted springing to my feet don't you see it don't you see it man see it see what lester repeated mr royce in amazement what's the matter old fellow no i haven't gone mad i laughed as he put a restraining hand on my arm it's the key to the mystery i added as calmly as i could i'm not going to tell you i want you to see it for yourself come along he followed me down to the street without a word though i could see how his hand trembled as he took down his hat i myself was quivering from head to foot with excitement with triumph what a blind fool i had been not to suspect it long ago godfrey had never seen curtis or he would have known the instant his eyes rested on that photograph luckily the journey was not a long one or i could not have kept the secret sit there i said when we reached my room and i motioned him to a chair near the table i turned down the light and arranged my properties let me confess at once to a secret liking for the dramatic the unexpected then i turned up the light now look at them i said and pointed to the three photographs placed side by side before him he stared at them at marcia lawrence at burr curtis smooth-faced and girlish at the soubrette i knew by the sudden deep breath he drew that he understood there could be no mistaking feature for feature they would not match at all but there was a tone an expression that little way of holding the head of course he said slowly at last of course how easily it explained marcia lawrence's panic her flight there could be no marriage no explanation only flight there's one crucial test i said glancing at my watch i'll make it this very evening an hour later i was shown for the third time into the study of dr schuyler at elizabeth he was sitting at his desk just as i had found him once before ah mr lester he began dr schuyler i interrupted i have a photograph here which i am very anxious for you to see this is it whose do you think it is he took it with a glance of astonishment moved over to the table and held it beneath the rays of the lamp why he faltered why it reminds me very strongly of young boyd endicott as he was when i knew him thirty years ago my heart leaped as a matter of fact dr schuyler i said it's a photograph of burr curtis as he was ten years ago he stared at me for a moment without understanding then i saw the light of comprehension in his eyes and he sank heavily back into his chair poor woman he murmured hoarsely poor woman and all the way back to new york i was wondering which of the women he had meant which was the more to be pitied the woman who thirty years before had been whirled away from her lover by a trick of fortune or the younger one 
innocent and unsuspecting, discovering only at the last moment the horrible abyss yawning at her feet. Which of the women had he meant? End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 The Revelation Neither Mr. Royce nor myself was quite equal to the routine work of the office next morning. We had solved the mystery, indeed, but so far from bringing us relief, the solution had brought us a terrible unrest. Miss Lawrence had chosen her words well when she had said that the marriage was quite, quite impossible. Yet who would have guessed a reason so dark, so terrifying, so unanswerable? small wonder that she had fled that her first thought had been to put the ocean between herself and her lover how could she meet him how look him in the eyes with that secret weighing upon her how would she face him when she found him awaiting her at liverpool i shuddered at thought of that meeting we should have held Curtis back, we should have known that it was no idle whim no empty fear which had driven her over sea Resolutely I tried to put such thoughts behind me, and to apply myself to the mass of work which had accumulated during my three days' absence. Was it only three days? It seemed weeks, months, since that moment when I opened the telegram from Mr. Royce which summoned me to Elizabeth. But they would not be frowned down, for there were many questions still unanswered. What had been Lucy Kingdon's connection with the mystery? Above all, why had Mrs. Lawrence permitted the courtship to go on? Perhaps she had not known. Only at the last moment after her daughter's disappearance had she suspected. No doubt it was that sudden revelation, confirmed perhaps by Lucy Kingdon, coming to her after she had left us in the library, which had struck her white and tremulous, which had urged her to tell me that the search must cease. Yet even then she had spoken as though the marriage might be arranged, as though it were not impossible. She had said that Curtis himself should choose. What had she meant by that? Was there some depth which we had not yet touched, some turn to the tragedy which we did not suspect? Had we really found the solution after all? My mind flew back to the Kingdon women with a sort of fascination, what had Harriet Kingdon meant by that wild outburst of hers? There are others, she had said, who have waved their rights and torn their hearts and withered in silence. What had she meant by that? What secret was it had torn her heart? Were the words merely a meaningless outburst, an incoherent cry, the result of a mind disordered? I could not bring myself to think so, but cudgel my brain as I might, I could read no meaning into them. Yet it was for her that Mrs. Lawrence had sent at that supreme moment when I had revealed to her the secret of the letter. It was of her she had spoken when she cried, I thought it was that woman. Harriet Kingdon had known the secret then, and had kept silence. Then suddenly it burst upon me what a hideous thing it was that she had done by keeping silent. It was the letter arriving at that last desperate moment which had snatched Marcia Lawrence and Burr Curtis from the horrible pit which yawned before them. The writing of that letter was not an act of enmity but of mercy. Harriet Kingdon had stood by and uttered no word of warning. I shuddered at the utter fiendishness of it. But who had written the letter? Then in a flash I knew. "'What is it, Lester?' demanded Mr. Royce, wheeling suddenly around. I suppose some exclamation must have burst from me, though I was not conscious of uttering any sound. "'What is it? I can guess what you're thinking of. I can't think of anything else.' "'I believe,' I answered, "'that I know who it was wrote that letter to Miss Lawrence.' "'You do?' he cried. "'Who was it?' "'Wait,' I said, and closed my eyes and pressed my hands tight against my temples in the effort at recollection. It was Mrs. Lawrence's aunt, her father's sister. It was to her house she came when she ran away. It was there, no doubt, that the child was born. "'And who is she?' asked our junior. "'Where does she live?' I made another desperate effort of memory. At last I had it. Her name is Hemingway, I said. I don't know her address, except that it's somewhere in New York. She was married to a banker. 
"'Oh, I knew him, Martin Hemingway,' and Mr. Royce jerked down a directory and ran feverishly through its pages. "'Here it is, East 54th Street.' He closed the book with a bang and took down his hat. "'Where are you going?' I asked. "'I'm going to see her,' he said. "'You're coming, too. We'll get to the bottom of this for Curtis's sake. Either we'll prove it a mistake, or we'll prove beyond doubt that it's true.' Neither of us spoke during that long drive uptown. We were too depressed, too anxious. Nor did we speak as we mounted the steps of the old-fashioned brownstone and rang the bell. We were admitted. We were shown into a room on the second floor, after some delay, where, in a great padded chair, an old, old woman sat, thin and wrinkled, but with eyes preternaturally bright, "'Mrs. Hemingway,' Mr. Royce began directly, "'we're representing Mr. Burr Curtis. "'We feel that some explanation is due him "'of the sudden flight three days ago of Marcia Lawrence, "'whom he was to marry, "'and we believe that you're the one best fitted "'to tell us the whole story.' "'She did not answer for a moment, "'but sat peering up at us, "'plucking at the arms of her chair "'with nervous, skinny hands.' "'Of course he has a right to know,' she cried, in a high, thin voice, like the note of a flute. "'I thought the girl would tell him.' "'But since she hasn't,' said our junior, "'I hope you will. I know it won't be a pleasant task.' She stopped him with a quick, claw-like gesture. "'I have never shrunk from any duty,' she said, however unpleasant. "'Sit down, gentlemen. I will tell you the story.' I am sure there was no evil in either of them, Boyd Endicott or Mary Jarvis. They were rather another Mildred and Merton, caught in the grip of circumstances and whirled asunder by one of those ironical tricks which fate sometimes loves to play. For on the night of the elopement, while Boyd Endicott, leaving Princeton on the eve of his Christmas vacation, was waiting for his bride at Trenton, with every preparation made to whirl her away to a new home in the West, she was speeding away from him toward New York. She had taken the train at Fanwood and was to change at Elizabeth. There, half dazed by the noise, bewildered by the storm which was raging, tremulous with fright, confused in the tangle of tracks, she had taken the wrong train. Boyd Endicott waited through the night, with what agony of doubt one can guess. Then, when morning dawned, believing Mary Jarvis faithless, believing she loved her father more than him, hot-blooded and impetuous, he had boarded a train and journeyed alone into the West, where they had planned to build up a new home together. He was never to know the true story of that night, for there in the West, two days later, his life had been crushed out. Meanwhile, almost paralyzed with fear, the girl arrived at New York. She was ill, benumbed, chilled with the cold. Darkness was coming on. She knew not where to turn, and finally, in an agony of desperation, she sought the home of Mrs. Hemingway. The cause of her illness could not be long concealed. She asserted that she was married, that she had been Boyd Endicott's wife for nearly a year, but her father did not believe her, for she had no marriage lines. She did not even know the name of the minister before whom their vows had been uttered. She could tell only of a long drive through the dashing rain one night when her father had been detained in town, of a hasty ceremony, of the drive home again. It was an incoherent story, at the best, and she told it in a half-delirium which made it more incoherent still. Her father was nearly mad with rage. In his first white wrath he was for sending her forth into the streets. But his sister reasoned with him. There was no need of a public disgrace. She would take the child. The sight of it should never offend him, nor should his daughter know aught concerning it. Doubtless they would have made some effort to verify her story, but the news of Boyd Endicott's death rendered that unnecessary, for their plan was laid. So the child was born, a boy, and the mother lay for days and weeks hovering between life and death. When she came again to consciousness they told her that the child was dead, had never lived indeed, 
They told her, too, no doubt with a kind of fierce exulting, how Boyd Endicott had met his end, a fit punishment from the hand of God. The past was buried with him. It must be as though it had never been. Mary Jarvis acquiesced. Life, it seemed, held nothing more for her. The future, no less than the past, was to her a dark and lifeless thing. She would have welcomed death, but it did not come. She grew slowly better, and at last she was able to go with her father to Scotland for a long visit among his people there, while he hastened home for his revenge, his pound of flesh. Whatever fault she had been guilty of, she expiated by taking, without love, for she knew that love would never come into her life again, the husband of her father's choosing. And seemingly she had never suspected that her child was living. Certainly she never dreamed that her instinctive tenderness for her daughter's lover was that of a mother for her son." So the years passed, and cast a veil about this sorrow, not concealing it, but rendering it less sharp, less poignant. To her daughter no whisper of this secret ever came until that terrible moment when she opened the letter marked, Important, read at once. The blow, of course, must have fallen. It was right that it should fall, but, oh, how it might have been tempered! Here is what she read in that half-darkened library, whither she had fled for refuge. Marcia Lawrence, I suppose that you have never heard of me, yet I am your mother's only living relative, her father's sister. There are painful memories, perhaps, which have caused her to wish to forget me, and it is not to claim relationship or ask for love or sympathy that I write this letter, but to fulfill a sacred duty— a merciful providence turned my eyes this morning to an article in the Tribune describing your approaching marriage, of which I have hitherto been kept in ignorance. From the name, age, and circumstances given concerning the bridegroom's life, I am certain he is your brother, your mother's son, born in sin in this house thirty-one years ago. So are the iniquities of the parents visited upon the children." Exodus thirty four seven twenty five. See also Leviticus twenty ten, one Corinthians six thirteen, Romans six twenty three. I thank God that He has enabled me to prevent this last iniquity. If any doubt remains to you, ask your mother for the story, or come to me and I will tell it you. Margaret Hemingway. One can guess how this horrible letter palsied her, how this first face-to-face -face encounter with the world's sin and misery tortured and sickened her, but she shook the weakness off. They would be seeking her in a moment. She must flee, must hide herself until she had time to think, to adjust herself to this new corroding fact which had come into her life. So she sought the Kingdon cottage, the nearest, most convenient refuge, and there had written that hasty, despairing note and entrusted it to Lucy Kingdon, who had brought her a gown to replace that mockery of satin. She had remained there hidden during the long afternoon, secure in the knowledge that these women, whose devotion to her had a peculiar intensity which she had not quite understood, would not betray her. Then, as soon as darkness fell, she had come to New York and sought Mrs. Hemingway. She must be quite certain, she must know the whole truth, and that old, old woman, with all the grimness of her creed, told her the story bluntly and cruelly, as she told it to us. The child had not died, but had been placed with the family of the manager of her husband's estate on Long Island, who himself did not know its history, who had in the end adopted it and given it his name. There could be no mistaking. I have called her merciless, for she seemed to glory in another's anguish, counting it fit retribution and a punishment from the Lord. Yet I trembled to think how more merciless she might have been had she withheld the truth. And when she had heard the story, Marcia Lawrence could no longer doubt. 
but one great load was lifted from her for she knew in her inmost heart that the story of that wild night drive was true she knew that her mother had been guilty of no sin there was a sweet comfort in the thought which made her burden less though it did not alter the problem which she herself must face she had been stabbed to the heart and the wound was bleeding still she had gone forth from the house white with agony she wanted time to rest to think to grow accustomed to the world again she had a battle to fight and hastily purchasing such clothing as she needed she had taken the first boat for england where she hoped to hide herself until the tumult in her heart subsided and she had gathered courage to face the world and her lover end of chapter twenty five Chapters twenty six and twenty seven of That Affair at Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson. Chapter twenty six The Return. It was not until we were back at the office again that either Mr. Royce or myself ventured a comment upon this extraordinary story. Even then we found very little to say nothing could be done to divert the blow nothing even to lessen its severity burr curtis and marcia lawrence must endure their fate with such courage as they could must forget at least must strive to soften love into affection how would they regard each other i wondered would the mere fact of revealed relationship alter their old feeling or would love survive to torture them they had in common no brotherly and sisterly instincts or experiences they were unchanged they were still maid and lover as they had always been the days passed and in the stress of work at the office the memory of burr curtis and his fortunes gradually became less vivid until i began to hope that in time it might really cease to worry me but one morning mr royce looked up from his paper his eyes shining the umbria reached liverpool this morning he said in a voice not wholly steady it's all over by this time i wonder how they bore it bravely i've no doubt i answered but i trembled at thought of it how had she summoned courage to tell him he'll come home i think added mr royce pursuing his own thoughts they could hardly stay abroad together their relationship of course will always remain a secret the office-boy entered and laid a little envelope at his elbow. He tore it open quickly and read its contents at a glance. "'It's a cable from Curtis,' he said, and passed it over to me. "'Oceanic delayed, engine breakdown,' I read. "'Reached Liverpool five hours after Umbria. Missed Marcia, but searching for her. Cable Care Hotel Adelphi.' Mr. Royce sat for a moment, drumming nervously upon his chair-arm. "'He hasn't any chance of finding her in a place like that,' he said at last. "'Most probably she's gone on to London. "'Or to some place on the continent. "'There must be many places where she'd feel at home. "'What would we better do? "'Shall we write out the story and mail it to Curtis? "'He'll get it in a week.' "'He won't stay at Liverpool a week,' I objected. "'The letter might go astray and be opened by someone who had no right to read it. "'We might cable a mere outline.' "'I thought it over, but somehow my point of view had changed. "'Now that I knew the story, it seemed to me that it was Marcia Lawrence's right "'to decide what step should be taken next. "'Once she had recovered her self-poise, she would see what course was best, "'and I was certain that she would be brave enough, strong enough, "'to follow it unshrinking to the end. "'Let us wait,' I said. "'A little delay can do no harm, just as haste can do no good.' "'Yes, I believe that's best,' agreed our junior. "'Nothing we can do will help them. "'They must work out the problem for themselves. "'Besides,' I added, "'I've a feeling that Miss Lawrence will herself decide to meet it squarely. "'She'll realize that Curtis has a right to know the story. "'I believe that she'll soon come home again, "'ready to face him and tell him everything. "'She'll see that it's cowardly to stay away. "'Then there's her mother. "'She'll think of her, of her misery and loneliness.' she won't leave her to live by herself in that great gloomy house 
were safe in leaving the future in her hands. But in the days that followed I came to doubt more and more whether this policy was the best one. Had I not been thinking too much of Miss Lawrence and too little of our client? Perhaps if he knew the secret he would no longer wish to pursue her. He might prefer to wait, to give time opportunity to heal the first rawness of the wound. Indeed it was conceivable that love might change to loathing. In that case it were better to have the crisis over with at once, to apply the knife before the sore had a chance to harden or grow deeper. Such heroic action might effect a cure. But I kept these doubts to myself. There was no use disturbing our junior with them. I could see how he was suffering on his friend's behalf. I could guess his fear that some dreadful tragedy would mark the end. The days passed, and we heard no more from Curtis, not a word to tell us how the search had progressed. Godfrey came in to see me once or twice, but he had nothing new to tell, and of course I had nothing to tell him. At last he expressed the opinion that we should never solve the mystery, and as the public had forgotten it long since, he decided to waste no more time upon it. Another visitor I had one afternoon when Dr. Schuyler's card was brought in to me. I ordered him shown in at once, and as I shook hands with him, I noted that he seemed grayer and older than when I had seen him last. Yes, he said with a smile, interpreting my glance. It's this trouble which has been weighing upon me. I've tried to shake it off, but I can't. Sit down, I said. I'm glad to see you, and I wouldn't allow the affair to worry me if I were you. That's easy enough to say, he retorted with a little shake of the head. But remember, Mr. Lester, Mrs. Lawrence and her daughter were two of my dearest friends, and this tragedy has wrecked their lives. Is there any news? None at all, except that Curtis missed the Umbria at Liverpool and has not been able to find Miss Lawrence. Perhaps that was best. I'm inclined to think so myself, I agreed. There's one thing, though, he added suddenly. Curtis has no reason to be ashamed of his birth. I looked at him with quick interest. Then you've discovered— "'Yes, the minister who married Mary Jarvis and Boyd Endicott. "'I couldn't rest after you showed me that picture, "'after I knew that Mary Jarvis had had a child. "'I felt that I must find out, for her sake as well as for my own. "'And so I set systematically to work. "'It was really not difficult, "'for there were not more than six or eight places "'where the ceremony could possibly have been performed. "'I took them one after another, and soon found the right one.' You see, I had the date, approximately. Her story was true in every detail. They had driven to Clearwater, about five miles north of Plainfield, a little village of two or three hundred inhabitants. The minister who married them is still living. He showed me the record, and he remembered the affair distinctly. The night was a very bad one, and he had been aroused from sleep by a loud knocking at the door. He had gone down, thinking that it was some neighbor come to summon him to the bedside of someone taken suddenly ill, and was surprised to find a handsome young fellow standing on the doorstep. He explained his errand in a few words, and ten minutes later the thing was done. The minister's wife was the only witness. The bride was very frightened, and more than once seemed about to faint, but managed to pull through, and was driven away with her husband a few minutes after the ceremony had been performed. The clergyman's face was glowing with satisfaction. It was a great thing to me, he added, to be able to prove that Mary Jarvis had told her father the truth. It seems strange, I said, that he never made any attempt to verify it. "'Ah, but he did,' broke in Dr. Schuyler quickly. "'He did verify it. "'At least it could have been no one else, in my opinion, "'from the description given me by the minister at Clearwater. "'He was there, and saw the record only a few days "'after that Christmas Eve on which his daughter attempted to run away. "'He never told his sister,' I said, "'and told him of Mrs. Hemingway's story. "'It was like him,' said my companion, "'after a moment's thought, to keep it to himself.' Perhaps he feared his sister would feel some tenderness for the child if she knew there was no shame attached to it. But whatever his motive, I am glad that I know the truth. And I, I said, 
It will be easier to tell Curtis if he must be told. And Marcia. I don't believe she ever doubted. Perhaps not, but it will be good for her to know. Yes, I agreed, and fell a moment silent. How would the story end? Poor children, said my companion, and rose with a little sigh. They must bear the burden with what strength they have. God send it be sufficient. I must bid you good-bye, Mr. Lester. I feel better now that you know the truth. I want everyone who knows the story to know this part of it. They shall, I promised. And if there is any way that I can help— You don't need to assure me of that, I interrupted. I shall call upon you without an instant's hesitation. Thank you, and he wrung my hand and was gone. How would the story end? I asked myself the question again as I sank back into my seat, and I could find no answer to it. But the end was nearer than I had thought. It was near closing time one afternoon, and we were finishing up some odds and ends of work, when the door opened, and in came Burr Curtis. We were on our feet in an instant, Mr. Royce and I, and had him by the hands. He was greatly changed older and thinner, with an increased lankness of jaw, but he had regained his equilibrium. He was no longer dazed by the blow fate had dealt him. The firm-set lips told that he had taught himself how to face the world and his own future. We sat down after the first greetings, and then there was a little pause. I was uncertain how to begin. I had a horror of opening old wounds which I saw that Mr. Royce acutely shared. "'Well, I'm back,' Curtis began, seeing our hesitation, and no doubt understanding it. I soon found out that I'd undertaken a hopeless task. "'Then you didn't find her?' asked Mr. Royce. "'No,' answered the other evenly. "'I completely lost track of her after she left Liverpool. I was able to trace her to the station, and to find that she'd taken train for London, and that was all.' So I decided that the wisest thing for me to do was to come home. My boat got in an hour ago, and I came straight here for news. Our junior nodded. Yes, I think you did right to come back, but I haven't any news. At least I believe that she herself would wish to tell you. Curtis turned sharp around. Then you know, he asked, you know why she left me? Mr. Royce paused an instant, then chose the better way. Yes, he said. Lester hit upon it, and we proved he was right. Curtis was out of his chair now, but he held himself well in hand. And you'll tell me? It was nothing that reflects on either of you. It was something neither of you could help nor do anything to alter. So it's bad news, and his face turned suddenly livid. "'Sit down, Curtis,' said our junior imploringly. "'It's hard enough at best. "'I can't tell you at all if you take it that way.' "'Curtis glanced at him again, then sat down. "'Now tell me,' he said quietly. "'But I saw how his hands were trembling. "'I don't wonder she fled,' began Mr. Royce, "'shrinking from the plunge. "'She couldn't face the world. "'But me,' cried Curtis, "'she could have faced me.' you least of all. Tell me, whispered Curtis, let me judge of that. There was no resisting him. It was his right to know. So our junior told the story as briefly as might be. He bore it better than I had hoped. After a time he was able to talk of it quite calmly, to ask a question or two, to tell us something of his own boyhood and of the people who reared him. I never suspected, he concluded, that John Curtis and his wife weren't really my grandparents. They told me that my father and mother were dead, and they certainly treated me as a child of their own. They had no other children, and doubtless by the time I came of age to ask questions, regarded me as wholly theirs. Mrs. Curtis died when I was sixteen, her husband three years later, just as I was ready to enter college, and I found that he'd made me his sole heir, and that I was worth some thirty thousand dollars. I went on to college, as they'd wished me to. And now, he added, what shall I do? Shall I go to Elizabeth and see Mrs. Lawrence? 
It was plain that he could not think of her as his mother. She had never been his mother. He had never known her as such. She had played no part in his childhood. I knew that one of the questions I had asked myself was answered. The mere revelation of kinship had made no difference in his feeling for Marcia Lawrence. He loved her yet. He had that battle still to fight. And she, was it the same with her? What a hideous irony of fate! Mrs. Lawrence knew nothing of the story I pointed out. She may know nothing of it even yet. She doesn't suspect that her child lived. I think her daughter means that she should never know if it can be kept from her. Then she shall never know from me, he said, and took a deep breath. I suppose that I'd better wait. Marcia can decide what's best to do. I, I don't think I quite realize what it all means. And he passed his hand before his eyes. The best thing for me is to go to work. That'll give me something else to think about. That's right, I said. Thinking about this won't do any good. Nothing will. No, he agreed, his lips bloodless. I begin to see that, to understand. The door opened and the office boy came in. Telegram, Mr. Lester, he said, and gave it to me. It was, Our Elizabeth correspondent writes Miss Lawrence home noon today. Godfrey. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 The Curtain Lifts For a moment I hesitated. Was it best to tell him? But a glance at his drawn face decided me. The search is over, I said. Miss Lawrence is home again, and I handed him the message. He read it at a glance, then started to his feet. "'Will you come with me, Mr. Lester?' he asked. "'I know I've given you a lot of trouble, but this will be the last, I think.' "'You haven't given me a bit of trouble,' I protested. "'I'll be glad to come.' "'Thank you,' he said simply, and held out his hand to Royce. "'You think it best to go?' the latter asked. "'Best? Oh, I'm not thinking of that. I'm going to her. I've got to see her. I can't wait. I—' He wrung our junior's hand without finishing the sentence, too overwrought indeed to finish it, and strode from the room— Mr. Royce held me back for a rapid word of warning. "'I'm glad you're going,' he said. "'He'll need someone. There's no telling what'll happen. Good luck.' When we were in the train, with the lights of Jersey City flying past us, I took occasion to examine Curtis again. He was lying back in the seat with his eyes closed, and the posture made his face seem even lanker and grimmer than it had at first appeared. I saw that I must keep my wits about me. When he awoke to a full realization of the trick fate had played him, he might, in his desperation. But you said Mrs. Lawrence told you she knew why Marcia had run away. The voice fairly made me jump. It came so suddenly, so unexpectedly. She did, I answered, turning to find his dark eyes open and strangely bright. But of course she was mistaken. She fancied it was something else, or she wouldn't have said what she did. What did she say? You told me, but I've forgotten. She said that the marriage wasn't impossible, that the choice should be left to you. He pondered this a moment, then his lips curved into an ironical smile. No doubt another family secret, he said. One would think we were in Corsica or Sicily. Well, we'll try to bear it. By the way, who's this fellow Godfrey who sent you that message? He's a newspaper man, a friend of mine, a mighty clever fellow. His face grew grimmer still. More food for the yellow press, he said with a harsh laugh. They certainly owe us a vote of thanks. He was in a dangerous mood. I saw his face harden and darken as he gazed out through the window. His lips moved, but no sound came from them. Then they closed again, compressed and bloodless, and he settled back in his seat as though he had taken a final resolution. I shuddered as I tried to guess what it was. I could imagine but one end for a drama so hideous as this. And then, as I lay back in the seat, gazing at him, a sudden ray of light flashed across my brain. The contour of the face, that poise of the head, where had I seen them? 
where but in the portrait of ruth endicott which hung upon the wall of the kingdon cottage since he resembled his father he would of course resemble her another link in the chain i told myself and trembled to think how strong it was nothing about the house had changed as we drove up to the door i saw that the blinds were still drawn as they had been at the time of my first visit and no ray of light came through them it seemed a house of death and a little shiver ran through me as curtis rang the bell there was a long delay a delay that tortured me for a dark vision danced before me the vision of a girl lying dead beneath the windows of the library with a portrait pressed close to her heart so vivid was it that i could not shake it off and i nearly cried aloud as a light was switched on in the hall and the door suddenly opened i looked up expectantly but it was not lucy kingdon it was a servant whose face i did not remember she took our cards and showed us into the room which when i had seen it last was gay with flowers then she left us not until she had gone did i remember that lucy kingdon was still fighting a battle with death as moment followed moment i found myself unconsciously gripping my hands tighter and tighter about the arms of my chair there seemed to be about the house an atmosphere of terror i could guess what agony of suspense curtis was enduring and i saw him wipe the perspiration from his forehead once or twice with a hand anything but steady perhaps she would not come perhaps she was not yet brave enough or perhaps she could not come there was a step at the door a woman entered it was mrs lawrence she came forward with a smile of welcome one glance at her face told me that she did not yet suspect that her daughter had kept the secret i knew you'd come she said then she is here asked curtis gripping his hands behind him devouring her face with his eyes feeling perhaps for the first time some instinct of sonship stirring within him yes she's here answered mrs lawrence still smiling at him she came only a few hours ago and is very tired too tired to talk even to me she doesn't feel strong enough to come down to see you now what power was it drew my eyes to the tapestry at the inner door i saw it swing aside almost imperceptibly i caught the glimpse of a face white as marble whose eyes dwelt upon curtis with a look of love of longing that turned me a little giddy she loved him yet god pity them both but she told me mrs lawrence was saying that if you'll come to-morrow morning she'll see you oh i can see how she suffered too much i think and you've suffered too she added and her eyes questioned his yes he said i've suffered too thank god it's past you see i don't doubt you i know that when you hear the story i have heard it curtis interrupted grimly and i saw a spasm of pain convulse the face at the door but mrs lawrence was looking up at him her eyes alight and it will make no difference she cried it can make no difference for you love her i know it i can see it you love her just as you always did yes said curtis hoarsely god help me i love her just as i always did then you can't give her up you won't that would be cruel would kill her i think for it's no fault of hers give her up echoed curtis seized suddenly with a terrible trembling no i'll never give her up i knew it she said triumphantly i knew i'd not misjudged you and there need be no scandal no one need ever know what was she saying what infamy was she proposing but not with the joy illumined face ah she did not understand and we should have to tell her it was wrong i know she went on more calmly but when the mother died he wanted to take the child to rear it as his own i had not given him any and since since there was a sorrow in my own life i could understand and forgive it was a kind of penance an atonement and i welcomed it besides he was not wholly to blame for she but i'll speak no ill of her and i grew to love the child for her own sake i grew to forget that she was not really mine 
Curtis was clutching blindly at a chair, his face ghastly, his eyes staring. "'I—I I don't think I quite understand,' he faltered. "'You—you're speaking of Marcia? "'Of Marcia, certainly, but you said you knew the story.' She was looking at him intently, her face suddenly pale. "'Was it something else?' she interrupted. "'Something else? Was it the letter? Tell me.' "'No, no,' he protested, and stopped, unable to go on. "'I don't think he heard it quite correctly, Mrs. Lawrence,' I said, seeing that he needed saving. "'Do I understand you to say Miss Lawrence isn't your daughter?' "'She's Ruth Endicott's daughter. She was housekeeper here, and she—she—' she, "'But no matter. No one knew except her cousins, the Kingdons. It was Harriet who took her away, to Florida, and she died there.' They promised to keep the secret. It was to their interest. We did everything we could for them. I was kinder to them than they deserved. But I loved the child. I had none of my own. I wanted to protect my husband's memory. Where was the sin in—' "'Where is she?' demanded Curtis hoarsely, but with a great light in his eyes. "'Where is she?' "'Then you don't mind? You won't—' "'Mind!' cried Curtis. "'Mind! Where is she?' The curtains at the door were swept aside, and a woman appeared between them, a woman regal with glowing eyes, with smiling, tremulous lips. Fool that I had been not to guess, not to see! It was the Endicott strain, first and last, dark, passionate, virile, and I had shut my eyes to it. I saw him turn toward her, his face aflame with joy. Then the hot tears blinded me, and I groped my way from the room, from the house, out into the silent night, and I looked up at the quiet stars, with Pippa's song singing in my heart, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. End of chapter 27 End of That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson